Hello, Clinic Review family. It's Dr. Sharon with Clinic Reviews, and I uploaded this week another short from Trevor Mueller talking about our clinic on demand. So go ahead and watch that if you hadn't, haven't already. And I am meeting with Mark soon, and he's going to give me all the details. And as soon as I know them, I will give you all the details because you're part of the family, and I will tell you as soon as I know something. Today we are going to do another fundamentals video because fundamentals is so critically important for you to pass NCLEX and we're going to do documentation. And I know it's not the most exciting thing, but I've had people tell me they've gotten documentation questions and they weren't sure how to answer them. So I want to make sure that you know how to answer these questions. And I'm also going to cover two things that I think are really important for you to know. It's how to answer questions that say, what order should you question? versus which order should you clarify? Those are two completely different questions, y'all. And you know how to have to, you need to know how to answer those. So let's go ahead and get started. The nurse contacts the healthcare provider about a change in a patient's condition and receives several new orders for the patient over the phone. When documenting telephone orders in the EHR, most hospitals require a nurse to do which of the following. Print out a copy of all telephone orders entered into the EHR in order to keep them in personal records for legal pur purposes. To read back all telephone orders to the provider over the phone to verify all orders were heard, understood, and transcribed correctly before entering the orders in the EHR. Record telephone orders in the EHR, but wait to implement the orders until they are electronically signed by the healthcare provider who gave them. And four, implement telephone orders immediately, but insist that the healthcare provider come to the patient care unit to personally enter the orders into the EHR. Sorry, I put that wrong within the next 24 hours. Um, so let's, I like you to get in the habit of reading the question, reading the answers, and reading the question again. It forces you not to go too fast and to make sure you know what you're answering. So let's read the question again. The nurse contacts the healthcare provider about a change in the patient's condition and receives several new orders for the patient over the phone. When documenting telephone orders in the EHR, most hospitals require a nurse to do which of the following. Okay. So the correct answer, I hope everybody is able to see the correct answer is number two, read back all telephone orders. That is the key thing. If they're going to talk to you about test you on telephone orders, the key thing is that you read back the order to make sure you have everything done correctly. And I know that in some hospitals now they're, they have, um, a policy because computer charting is available on the doctor's cell phones and on their computers at home and on the computers in their offices. A lot of hospitals have policies where the nurses don't input orders anymore, but that does not matter. If that's the policy at your hospital where the doctors don't give telephone orders, well, they may call and tell you what to do, but they have to put them in themselves. That doesn't matter. The rule still is that if you're taking a telephone order <clears throat> that you have to read them back because there's still many places, nursing homes and all kinds of places where you're still taking telephone orders. So make sure you read them back. Next question. The nurse is working in an agency that has recently implemented an EHR. Which of the following are acceptable practices for maintaining the security and confidentiality? So this isn't so much about documentation. It's about security and confidentiality. So let's read the answers. Use a strong password and change your password frequently according to agency policy. To allow a temporary staff member to use your computer username and password to access the electronic record. Three, ensure that work lists and any other data that must be printed from the EHR are protected throughout the shift and dispensed of in a locked receptacle designated for documents that are to be shredded when no longer needed. Four, ensure that the patient information that is displayed on the computer monitor that you're using is not visible to visitors and other healthcare providers who are not involved in the patient's care. And five, remain logged into a computer to save time if you only need to step away to administer a medication. So let's read through these again, just to make sure we know what is being asked. The nurse is working in an agency that has recently implemented an EHR. Which of the following are acceptable practices for maintaining security? So we're looking for the right stuff, the correct things to do. So should we use a strong password and change the password frequently to maintain security and confidentiality? Yes, we should do that. So we're going to pick number one. Should we allow temporary staff member to use our username and password to maintain security and confidentiality? No, we should not. That doesn't maintain security and confidentiality. Should we three, ensure that work lists are protected throughout the shift and disposed of in a locked receptacle design designated for documents that are to be shredded when no longer needed to maintain security and confidentiality. Yes, we should do that. 
Should we ensure that the patient information that is displayed on the computer monitor is not visible to, to visitors and other healthcare providers who are not involved in the patient's care to maintain security and confidentiality? Yes, we should do that. Should we remain logged into a computer to save time if you only need to step away to administer medication to maintain security and confidentiality? No, we should not do that. So the key thing here, and I've, if you've watched any of my SATA videos, is that you have to um, link each answer to the question itself. In SATA, in SATA questions, you have to link each answer to the question itself. That's why for every single item, I said to main, I, I said you do this in order to maintain security and confidentiality. Because five, you know what? In real life, I probably remain logged into the computer to save time if I only need to step away to administer med. I mean, if the computer's in the room and I'm standing right there and they're right here, I'm going to stay logged in. But that's not what I do to ensure and maintain security and confidentiality. So I'm not going to pick it. So the correct answers are one, three, and four. All right. Next question. The nurse who works at the local hospital is transferring a patient to an acute rehab center in another town. To complete the transfer, information from the patient's EHR must be printed and faxed to the rehab center. Which of the following actions is most appropriate for the nurse to take to maintain privacy and confidentiality of the patient's information when faxing this information? All right, that's a long question to ask how to maintain privacy and confidentiality when faxing something. All right, one, confirm that the fax number for the acute rehab center is correct before sending the fax. Two, use the encryption feature on the fax machine to encode the information and make it impossible for staff at the acute rehab center to read the information unless they have the encryption key. Three, fax the patient's information without a cover sheet so the person receiving the information at the acute rehab center can identify it more quickly. Four, after sending the fax, place the information that was printed out in a standard trash can after ripping it into several pieces. And five, after sending the fax, place the information that was printed out in a secure canister marked for shredding. All right, let me reread the question because I want you to get in the habit of reading the question, reading the answers, and reading and then selecting your correct answer. So we're at a local hospital transferring patient to rehab. We have to fax printed, we have to print and fax the information to the rehab center. Which of the following actions is most appropriate for the nurse to take to maintain privacy and confidentiality of the patient's information when faxing this information? So I don't think you'll get a question this long, probably. You'll probably get more on the, on the NCLEX. You could definitely get a question like this, but it's probably just going to say, when faxing information, with how do you maintain privacy and confidentiality? This is a long question. All right, so it's how do you maintain privacy and confidentiality when faxing? So one, confirm that the fax number for the acute rehab center is correct before sending the fax in order to maintain privacy and confidentiality. Yes, I, that would maintain it by confirming the fax number is correct. Use the encryption feature on the fax machine to encode the information and make it impossible for staff at the acute rehab center to read the information else they have the encryption key in order to maintain confidentiality and privacy. Yes, that would do that for sure. Three, fax the patient's information without a cover sheet so that the person receiving the information at the acute rehab center can identify it more quickly in order to maintain privacy and confidentiality. No, that would not be that. That wouldn't maintain privacy and confidentiality. Four, after sending the fax, Place the information that was printed out in a standard trash can after ripping it into several pieces in order to maintain privacy and confidentiality. Okay, printing, putting something in a regular trash can doesn't maintain privacy and confidentiality, even if I rip it up. So no. After sending the fax, place the information that was printed out in a secure canister marked for shredding in order to maintain privacy and confidentiality. Yes, that would be correct. I would do that. Okay, so again... Um, documentation can be about how to document or it can be about how to maintain privacy and confidentiality while documenting. Next question. The nurse is administering a dose of metoprolol to a patient. As the barcode information on the medication is scanned, an alert appears on the computer screen. In quotes, do not administer the dose if apical heart rate is less than 60 or systolic blood pressure is less than 90. The alert that appeared on the computer screen is an example of what type of system? One, clinical decision support system, charting by exception, EHR, or computerized physician order entry. All right, so let's read the question again. The nurse is administering a dose of metoprolol, so you scan it, 
and you get an alert. Don't give it if the heart rate is less than 60 or the SVP is less than 90. The alert that appeared on the computer screen is an example of what? All right, I know it's not charting by exception number two, and I know it's not number three EHR. So it's somewhere between clinical decision support system or computerized physician order entry. And the correct answer is clinical decision support system. Uh, I put this in here because there's a lot of things that we do uh, in charting and we know how to do it. We know what it means, but we don't know the official name for it. So I just want you to know the official name for it. When those, when those uh, notes pop up and those alerts pop up like that, those are called cl uh, when we're passing meds, not when we're in looking at the orders, but when we're you know passing meds and, and we get these alerts that pop up, that's a clinical decision support system. So just to let you know, that's what that is. The nurse is changing the dressing over the midline incision of a patient's Surgical incision, I can't read under my clinic review thing. Assessment of the incision reveals changes from what was documented by the previous nurse. Okay, so changing the midline incision after surgery. Assessment of the incision reveals changes from what was documented by the previous nurse. So it's a change from previous assessment. After documenting the current wound assessment, the nurse contacts the surgeon by telephone to discuss concerns. Which of the following is the most appropriate way for the nurse to document this conversation? Now, I had uh, the reason I put this in here because it doesn't seem like that hard of a question. But the reason I put it in here is I had someone tell me they got a question like this on NCLEX and they're like, I don't remember. I wasn't taught this. So because we don't do many notes anymore, you can still put notes in, by the way, even in electronic health records, there's notes you can write. And I write notes all the time, to be honest. You know, when I started writing notes, I know this is off track, but I started writing notes over COVID uh, because so many crazy things happened that I wanted to document in the notes. So I started writing a ton of notes over COVID. So now I still, I write notes. I don't just do charting by exception anymore, but um, I mean, I do that too, but I write notes. So some people are like, I haven't written a note since I started nursing school. So this is the proper way to, to write a note. So write the note, healthcare provider notified about the change in assessment of the abdominal incision with your signature. Number two, the date notified the doctor by name, by phone, that there's a new area of redness around the patient's incision with your signature. Three, the time contacted the doctor by name and notified about changes in abdominal incision uh, name. And then the date for date and time the doctor by name contacted by phone, notified about new area of bright red erythema extending approximately one inch around circumference of the midline abdominal incision and oral temperature of 101.5. No orders received with your signature. Now that's the correct way to document that. So, and some of you may go, well, okay, but when I go into writing a note in the EHR, I mean, it automatically records the date and the time. I don't have to write all that stuff down. I don't even have to sign it. Well, you have to click sign, but I don't have to actually sign it like by writing my name because it does it automatically. You're right. But there, this is still the principle and they're testing whether you know the principle because what if you get a job somewhere that doesn't have electronic health records and you have to document it by hand? There's places that do that. And this is how you do it. You have to do the date and the time. You have to say who you contacted, what specifically did you contact them about? And then did you get any orders? And then you have to sign it. So that's the correct way to document something. And you need to know that. All right, now I'm going to talk about the difference between clarifying an order and questioning an order. And this is a very specific way of reading the question, and you need to know how to read the question, okay? So let's start with clarification. Now, clarification means there's something that was written that's not complete. It's an incomplete order, and I have to clarify it. It does not mean this is the wrong order for the wrong patient. That's not what it means. It means there's an incomplete order. So you, when it asks you what you're clarifying, don't say, well, maybe this is the wrong drug. That is not what they're asking when it's a clarif clarification question. You're looking for incomplete information or an unapproved abbreviation. That's what you're looking for, okay? So one, change open midline abdominal incision using wet to moist normal saline and gauze. Okay, so it's okay. Um, I mean, it doesn't, oh, incision daily. I'm sorry, I missed it, daily. Change open midline abdominal incision daily using wet to moist normal saline and gauze. This is why it's so important to read stuff carefully because I'm like, it doesn't tell me how often, but it does right there. It says daily. Perfect. So that's everything. I can follow that order. It's a complete order. Two, lorazepam, 
That's the drug name, the dose, 0.5 milligrams. PO is oral. Every four hours, PRN for anxiety. That's the frequency. So that's a complete order. Morphine sulfate, that's the drug name. One milligram is the dose. IV push is the route. Every two hours, PRN, severe pain. That's the frequency. Insulin, aspart, drug name, 8U. U is an unapproved abbreviation. Units has to be spelled out. Sub Q is the route every morning before breakfast is the frequency, but there is an unapproved abbreviation. So when they ask me what to clarify, I'm looking for either an incomplete order or an unapproved abbreviation. Okay. So that's clarification. If you take notes, write that down. You got to remember it. Here's another clarification question. The nurse is caring for a patient with high blood pressure. Which of the following orders requires clarification by the nurse? Acetaminophen, 500 milligrams, POPRN for pain. Amlodipine, 10 milligrams PO daily, 0.9 normal saline, 75 mils per hour continuous IV, or furosemide, 10 milligrams PO twice daily. All right, so I'm going to read it again. Which of the following orders requires clarification? Now, this is not whether this is the right order for the right patient. That's not what clarification means. So don't say, well, maybe amlodipine is the wrong dose. That's not what you're asking. You're saying, is it a complete order? or is there an unapproved abbreviation? So acetaminophen is their drug name. 500 milligrams is the dose. PO is the route. PRN pain. There's no frequency, y'all. You have to say PRN how often because it just says PRN pain. That means I get to decide how often. I can give it every 30 minutes if I want to. Wrong. There has to be a frequency. There's no frequency there. Okay. Amlodipine, drug name, 10 milligrams, dose, PO, route, daily frequency. It's all there. 0.9 normal saline, that's the drug name, 75 mils an hour, that's the dose, continuous IV is the frequency and the route, so that's that's a complete order, furosemide, drug name, 10 milligrams, dose, PO, route, twice daily frequency, so the one that's not completely written is the acetaminophen, so don't say, well, maybe the furosemide shouldn't be given twice a day, or maybe that's the wrong dose, they've got high blood pressure, or they, they shouldn't be getting IV fluids, that's not what it's asking you, it is a clarification question, you gotta trust me on this, uh, if you see clarification questions in your database of questions, make sure you use this strategy, and you'll find that it works, all right, now we're going to move on to question. The nurse is admitting a client with dehydration. Which of the following orders should the nurse question? Now you only question orders that can harm the patient. Harm the patient. You question orders that can harm the patient. So you have to have some reason to think it could harm the patient. Okay. So what do they have? They have dehydration. Okay. Is there anything ordered here that could harm them? Acetaminophen, 500 milligrams, POQ6 hours, PRN for pain. Can acetaminophen harm a patient with dehydration. And y'all don't read into it. Don't read into it. No, there's no reason to think acetaminophen could harm a patient with dehydration. Administer oxygen PRN to maintain a saturation greater than 92%. Could that harm a patient with dehydration? No. D5 water, 500 mil bolus IV now. Well, I like the bolus, they're dehydrated, but could giving D5 and water as a bolus harm a patient? Yes, it could because the you never bolus, y'all. You never do high rates with D5, okay? Never, never, never. Or dextrose solutions. You always bolus or rehydrate with normal saline or lactated ringers. But on the NCLEX, it's almost always normal saline. Don't rehydrate with D5 or any kind of dextrose solution. So I don't like number three, measure vital signs according to unit protocol. Can that harm the patient? It cannot. <clears throat> no, that's not going to harm the patient. So the only one that could possibly harm the patient is to rehydrate them with a dextrose solution. And that's because you give them this huge bolus of a dextrose solution, the dextrose gets metabolized and all you've got left is this uh, water solution, which is hypotonic and it can cause some fluid shifting when you give them that high dose of a hypo, essentially a hypotonic solution because that dextrose get burned, gets burned off pretty fast. So that's why that could harm that. You don't have to know that necessarily. I'm just telling you why that could harm a patient. All right, last one, and I've worded it a little differently. The RN watching a new grad start, the RN is watching a new grad start of blood transfusion. Which of the following actions that the RN observes requires immediate action? All right, this is the exact same question. It doesn't say which order will you question, but when it says which action requires immediate action, that says which can harm the patient. I only take immediate action if it can harm the patient. If it's not going to harm the patient, I can talk about it later or whatever. But if it's if it's going to harm the patient, I got to go in and interrupt what you're doing and say, stop, okay? 
So they're getting a blood transfusion. So which of these could harm the patient? Uh, starts a 20 gauge IV in the left forearm. Could that harm the patient? And don't say, well, it could hurt and they, it would be better if they had an 18 gauge. Y'all, no, no. We start IVs on everybody that comes in the hospital and it doesn't, it hurts, but it doesn't harm them. Do you understand what harm means? Everything we do in the hospital is uncomfortable and can hurt, right? Every single thing causes discomfort. So don't say, well, it could be uncomfortable. No, no, that's not what we're asking. We're talking about harm here. And starting an IV in the left forearm is not going to harm and a 20 gauge is fine for blood. They flush the blood tubing with D545 sodium chloride IV solution. Could that harm the patient? Yes, because if you if you uh, flush the tubing with a dextrose solution and then you put the blood through it, it's going to clump up in the tubing and that could harm the patient. They could get a clot. So I don't like, I, two, I absolutely have to stop. I'm like, stop. We got to get new tubing and some normal saline. We can't be flushed with that. We got to stop. Three, sends the UAP to pick up the blood from the lab. That's totally fine. The UAP is allowed to go pick up the blood from the lab. Four, measures vital signs 30 minutes before starting the blood. That's fine. Um, as long as you take it before, I would say, uh, you know, 30 minutes, maybe the maximum amount of time you want to check vital signs before starting the blood, but up to 30 minutes is fine before starting the blood. It doesn't have to be like right the minute before you start the blood. So the only one that can cause harm is flushes the blood uh, sorry, flushes the tubing with D5. All right. I hope that was helpful. Um, these are the kind of questions you can get on NCLEX and you want to get them right because, it, and these are the kind that you don't necessarily study for. Look, I'll be honest with you. I, we don't necessarily study like correct documentation, right? And so then we get these and we're guessing, we're hoping we're guessing right. Maybe we freaked out a little bit, so we didn't guess right. So make sure you know how to do this and make sure you know how to answer these questions. Fundamentals is absolutely key in passing. Take a look at our shorts. Go to clinicreviews.com to see when we have upcoming reviews. I have an upcoming uh, live in-person review if you're interested in coming to see me in LA. So I'd love to see you in LA. So uh, have a great rest of your week. Take care.